Grace and Peace. This is New Testament video 163. Luke lesson 6. We will begin Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. Heavenly Father, may the eyes of our understanding be enlightened as we search the scriptures and we give you all the praise, the glory, and the honor that you alone deserve. In Christ's name, amen. Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2, verse 1. Luke chapter 2, verse 1. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria, and all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. Stop there. The opening five verses of Luke chapter 2, we will expound them now. Caesar Augustus, the Roman emperor, the Roman emperor, remember one common theme of Luke. Is the Gentiles, in this case, the Roman government. Luke, he has given us historical markers in his gospel record. Remember, this is not fantasy. This is not fiction. This is not fairy tale time. Oh, this is story time. Here's a nice story. This really happened. The only people, really, okay, I don't want to be, I don't want to be mean, but I, I do want to be frank. I do want to be honest. The only people who complain that the Bible is fiction, it's fairy tales, stories that Jews told around ancient campfires, the only person who says that is one of two things. One, they are mindlessly parroting. They're repeating what somebody else told them. They didn't think for themselves, they just mimic what somebody else whined about. Or two, they're being dishonest deliberately. So one, it's unintentional, or two, it's intentional. All too often, I'm afraid it's, it's willful ignorance, though. Okay? Because remember, oh, remember. God gives us over to what we want. Do we want light or darkness? Romans chapter 1. If we want darkness, God gives us over to it. Ooh. Anybody who has an eye to see, an ear to hear, and a heart to believe can see Luke. We saw it already in Luke chapter 1, not in the days of Herod the Great. Herod the Great was a physical, literal man. According to Jewish history, according to Roman history, okay? world history, 
agrees with the Bible. In this case, chapter 2 now, this is in the days of Caesar Augustus, Roman emperor. He really existed. Roman history, world history. There was indeed a Roman emperor, Caesar Augustus. We'll see more about him in a minute. There's a decree, Luke 2, 1. It came to pass in those days. That is, while John the Baptist, remember, is a child. In those closing verses of chapter 1, John the Baptist is growing up. He was born back in chapter 1. He's six months older than Jesus Christ. Christ will be born here in chapter 2. So, this is roughly six months after the birth of John the Baptist. In those days of John the Baptist's infancy, in the days of John's early life outside the womb, Luke chapter 2, there's a decree there's an order, a mandate. The Roman Emperor, Caesar Augustus, he orders all the world to be taxed. Remember I told you in our last study, Israel's enemies, Israel, Zacharias preached, John the Baptist's father preached, Israel will be saved from her enemies. Who are her enemies? The Gentiles. The Gentiles. The rulers of the world system. Remember, at one time, with David and Solomon, Israel was the leading nation in the earth. God had set them aside from the rest of mankind, the, the, the nations. They were God's chosen people. They had, Israel had political preeminence in the earth. Those five courses of judgment came centuries prior to Luke writing. And what happened? The fifth course, Leviticus 26. Fifth course is Israel. You are out of the land. Out of the land. In captivity amongst the Gentiles. And in the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 2 specifically, Daniel chapter 2 delineates all the world empires, the Gentiles, that will reign over the earth because Israel lost her political might. God took it from her. It began back in the days following Solomon's demise, the second course of chastisement. But the throne of David was finally lost with the Babylonian captivity. King Zedekiah was the final son of David to reign on David's throne in Jerusalem. Well, since that time, in the fall of Jerusalem, almost 600 years prior to Christ's birth, the Babylonians, Daniel 2, the Babylonians, ruled the earth. The Babylonians conquered the Jews. The Assyrians conquered the Jews. Babylonians conquered the Jews. Medes and Persians conquered the Babylonians. They conquered Israel. Greeks, Romans, 
Now look, the Romans, there they are. Israel is under those five courses of chastisement. She is under Gentile dominion until the second coming. And Luke calls to mind, he calls to our attention. Israel is under Roman authority. Who is reigning in the earth, in the land of Palestine? Not David's son. It's Caesar. Caesar Augustus. The Roman emperor. And Israel is under Gentile oppression. Caesar Augustus orders the Jews, as well as all the Roman Empire. Now, now oh, should, should I say it or not? Yes, let me say it. Because there's so much ignorance. How do we fight ignorance? How do we fight Bible ignorance? It's easy to complain. Oh, they're ignorant. Oh, they're ignorant. No. Rather than whine about ignorance, how about we teach? See, that, that, that's how we solve the problem. There's no education. What do we do? We teach. Okay. I think the body of Christ has utterly failed. The professing church, the genuine church, whatever you want to call it, all of organization has failed miserably, miserably, miserably. We've, we've complained and griped about how the world is lost, unsaved, in darkness. Or are we any better? Do we have any light? We've spent so much time, so much time forming our denominations and our local churches and our ministries and defending our statements of faith and our creeds, and our rites, and our rituals, and our ceremonies. Oh, we've clung to those. But have we yearned for sound Bible doctrine? I'm hungry for the Word of God. No, no, no. We're not hungry for that. We have no appetite for that. Why? Because we're filled with the sense of flesh and the Spirit. We come, we come to church, not to study the Bible, but to have a good time. Oh, See, praise and worship, that's our problem. That's our problem. We are so focused on the outward, the external, feel good, feel good religion. The flesh was entertained, amused, and we, and we attracted the world. Come, come to the church, we can, we can entertain you. And what happened was, we enticed unsafe people, the quote, unchurched people to come. Come! They came. They joined us in our social club, our good time, and they left the church building, lost, just as they came in. But they had a good time, didn't they? We had a good time, huh? Yes, you see, the sins of the flesh, the sins of the spirit, that's, what's pre that's what has preoccupied us. Okay? And since we spent all our time doing that, well, no wonder the world is in darkness. Because the very people, us, we have the light, huh? Don't we have a Bible? Yeah. If we, the church, the body of Christ, have the Bible, and we're confused, and we're in darkness, what does that tell us about the, the world around us that doesn't have the Bible? See? Oh, okay, getting back to Luke 2. This is Bible study. This is Bible teaching. God doesn't want ignorant Christians. Our Christian life will not, not, not operate on the basis of ignorance. That's why so many Christian lives are in utter shambles. I don't have time to read the Bible. I'm too busy. Hmm? All right, go ahead. Have at it. If you're too busy for sound Bible doctrine, 
If your life doesn't show it now, it will. You'll have a quite a time straightening out that mess, my friend. Luke chapter 2. When the Bible says, verse 1, all the world should be taxed, that's not, 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 not to imply that the Holy Spirit or that Luke actually meant every single inhabitant of the earth, anybody who was living in Australia, somebody who might have been living on Antarctica, Back in those days, you mean they all went to be taxed too because of Caesar Augustus? He had jurisdiction over them too? Now look again, okay? There's no error here. When the Bible speaks of all the world being taxed, all the world being under Caesar Augustus' authority, that's to say, Caesar Augustus, he is at the head, he is the head of the leading world empire of that day. God has arranged it to be like that because Israel lost their political might in the earth. Israel is politically fallen. There is no son of David reigning from Jerusalem. God fixed it like that. Israel, and you go look in the book of Daniel, Israel is under Gentile dominion, oppression, until the return of Christ, when Jesus Christ, the ultimate son of David, sits on David's throne. Israel's restored politically. Right. Caesar Augustus, he is the leader of the world empire of that day, the Roman Empire, the ruling empire of the day. Let me tell you a little about Caesar Augustus. <laughs> we'll let the critics whine in a minute about verse 2. Verse 1, though. Verse 1, Caesar Augustus, Caesar Augustus, he was the first, and according to many, the greatest Roman emperor. 31 B.C. to A.D. 14. So he reigned over 40 years, 45 years or so having replaced the republic with an imperial form of government. He expanded the empire to include the entire Mediterranean world, established the famed Pax Romana, Roman peace, and ushered in the golden age of Roman literature and architecture. Augustus, which means exalted, was a title voted to him by the Roman Senate in 27 BC. Here's a little more about Caesar Augustus. He was a real man, okay? He, this really happened. Caius Octavius, grandnephew, adopted son, and primary heir to Julius Caesar. That's Caesar Augustus here. Before and after Julius's death in 44 BC, the Roman government was constantly torn by power struggles. Octavius ascended to undisputed supremacy in 31 BC by defeating his last remaining rival, Antony, in a military battle at Actium. In 29 BC, the Senate, the Roman Senate, declared Octavius Rome's first emperor. Two years later, they honored him with the title Augustus, exalted one, a term signifying religious veneration. They worshipped him, in other words, as a god. Paganism, pagan Romanism. 
Rome's republican government was effectively abolished and Augustus was given supreme military power. He reigned until his death at age 76, AD 14. Under his rule, the Roman Empire dominated the Mediterranean region, ushering in a period of great prosperity and relative peace. Pax Romana. Luke 2, verse 2. And here is another controversy. More Bible critics. Let's hear them, though. Let's hear their best case. So, there's a taxing, verse 1. A taxing. There's a, a census. The purpose is for military service and taxation. Now, the Jews couldn't serve in the Roman military. But when the Bible says all the world should be taxed, the Roman Empire, the Roman Emperor, I should say, this wasn't just a one-time census. This decree established that there would be a period every 14 years. In this case, concerning Israel, it wasn't to recruit them the military service, but it was designed to number, to keep track of each nation by family, by tribe, and so on. And we'll, we'll see, we, we already saw, Joseph and Mary, they're of the house and lineage of David. They're moving from Galilee, Nazareth of Galilee, to Bethlehem of Judah. We'll say more about that in a bit. This census here, they were gathering population statistics, this taxation, in order to keep track of all the Roman citizens, as well as all the inhabitants of the empire. Look at Luke 2, verse 2. And here's where the critics have a field day. Luke 2, verse 2. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. Now listen. Try to outline this as simply as possible. Here is the critics' argument. Let, let them speak. Luke 2, 2. The taxing was first made when Cyrenius, Cyrenius was governor of Syria. Now, Herod the Great, Herod the Great, remember, that was in Luke chapter 1, verse 5. Herod the Great, he died no sooner than about 1 B.C., Now, here it is. Christ will be born before Herod dies. Herod the Great dies in Matthew 2. Matthew chapter 2. Jesus was a little boy. Two, three years old, four years old, somewhere like, like that. Jesus was a little boy when Herod the Great died. Okay. Well, Jesus in Luke 2 is not even born yet. Okay. So, Herod is still living. Herod is still alive. Okay. So, we can estimate that Christ was born... Let's say 4 B.C. Now, there's an argument. It goes back to about 7 B.C. Christ was born somewhere during that time. 7 B.C., 4 B.C. Now, see this Cyrenius, Luke 2, 2. Cyrenius, governor of Syria, allegedly, he was not governor of Syria until A.D. 6. So, if Luke 2, verse 
1 and 2 here. If this was BC, if the taxing was BC, if Christ would have been born, in other words, 7 to 4 BC, and that's Luke chapter 2 there, well then, Cyrenius couldn't have been governor for another eight years. So how can Luke report to us that Cyrenius was governor of Syria at the time of 4 BC when Cyrenius wasn't governor of Syria until AD 6? Cyrenius wasn't governor until A.D. 6. So how can Luke be off by all those years? Cyrenius wouldn't have been governor at that time. According to the Bible critics, Luke 2 verse 2 is an historical error. A mistake. Oh, a mistake. No, no mistake. Cyrenius. Let me say this. Cyrenius. That's in a King James Bible. Now, in the modern versions, the modern English versions, they refer to him Quirinius with the, the letter Q. His full name his full name, his historical name, Publius Sulpicius Quirinius. Publius Sulpicius Quirinius. Okay. Don't worry, I won't <laughs> spell that out for you, but I do have it spelled. Okay. The Jewish historian Josephus he reports, indeed, there was a census conducted in Palestine in A.D. 6. Now, Acts 5.37 makes reference to that census, that taxation. Now, Cyrenius, Cyrenius was in charge of that taxation, and he punished the rebels, the Jewish rebels, but that was not the census of Luke 2, 1 and 2. The dating is wrong. The A.D. census was a decade, the A.D. 6 census was a decade after this census of Luke 2. So, Luke had another census in mind in chapter 2 here. Luke is not referring to the one of Acts 5, Acts 5.37. He's not referring to the one in A.D. 6. Listen, let me read this to you. A fragment of stone discovered at Tivoli, near Rome, in A.D. 1764 contains an inscription in honor of a Roman official who, it states, was twice governor of Syria and Phoenicia during the reign of Augustus. The name of the official is not on the fragment, but among his accomplishments are listed details that, as far as is known, can fit no one other than Quirinius. Thus, he must have served as governor in Syria twice. He was probably military governor at the same time that history records Verus was civil governor there. So listen. In about 8 BC, Roman Emperor Caesar Augustus sent out the decree for the census to be undertaken, the taxation to be administered. But it wasn't undertaken until three or four years later. 
about 4 BC, that'd be the birth of Christ. We'll see that shortly. Herod the Great was in the, the final days of his reign. And there were complications, political disagreements between he and Rome. There was a census taken in Luke 2, verse 2 here, when Cyrenius was military governor of Syria. Varus was the civil governor of Syria. Many years later, Cyrenius was the civil governor of Syria. So let me, let, me, let me summarize it like this. Really simple, and don't misunderstand me. There is no historical mistake in the Bible in Luke 2, 1 and 2. Cyrenius, or Quirinius, he reigned as governor of Syria twice. Syria was the Roman province in which the land of Palestine existed. Luke 2, 1 and 2, refers to a census taken during Cyrenius' first term. Then he served a second term, and there was another census. That second census was AD 6 or so. The first term of Cyrenius would have been 6 to 4 BC. That's one census. That's the census of Luke 2. Then there was another census years later during his second term, AD 6 to 9. And that's the one in Acts 5, 37. So the Holy Spirit through Luke, the Holy Spirit through Luke, is particular about the time here when Cyrenius was governor the first time. That's when the census was taken here in Luke 2. So Cyrenius, yes, he reigned later than Luke 2. That was his second term, though. He was reigning Earlier, a first term, Luke 2. See, see, the skeptics, what they do is they don't see him reigning twice. He had two terms. They complain as if he reigned once, his second term. And they say, well, that second term was much later than the time that Jesus could have been born. Yes, exactly. That's his second term. His first term coincided with Luke 2, the opening verses. All right, so no historical mistake. Cyrenius reigned twice. Okay. This is the first term of Cyrenius. Verse 3, Luke 2, 3. And all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. Now remember, I'll bring my map of Palestine back the land of Israel, we see, what does the Bible say? Luke 2, 4. Joseph leaves Galilee. He leaves Nazareth and goes to Judea unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. Back in chapter 1, back in chapter 1, verse 26 and 27, remember? In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. Joseph and Mary, Joseph is of the house of David. Joseph is 
a descendant of King David, and so is Mary. See that in chapter 3 of Luke. Joseph's royal bloodline, that's Matthew 1. We looked at that a long time ago when we started Matthew. But Joseph and Mary, they live in Galilee, Nazareth. Okay? Here's Nazareth, right here. Nazareth, Galilee. Now, they have to travel south. They have to return to their ancestral home. They're of the house of David. So they go to the city of David. And be sure to understand, the city of David in this context is not Jerusalem. The city of David is Bethlehem. Bethlehem. And we want to clarify, it's Bethlehem of Judea. The Bethlehem of the south. Here's Jerusalem. Okay? Bethlehem of the south. Bethlehem of the south is right here. South of Jerusalem. Right here. There was another Bethlehem up in the north. And that's why the book of Micah predicts it's Bethlehem Judea. Ephrathah. King David. He was from Bethlehem. Ephrathah, Bethlehem, Judah, Bethlehem, Judea, 1 Samuel 16. Because Joseph and Mary, they're both of the house and lineage of David, they go to where the genealogical or family records are kept. And that's Bethlehem, Judea. The city of David, Bethlehem of Judea, now, what happens to Joseph and Mary while they're in Bethlehem of Judea? Let me keep reading. Luke 2, 5. To be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. Mary and Joseph. Now, now Mary's pregnant. Okay? She's soon to deliver the Lord Jesus Christ. She is Joseph's espoused wife. They're engaged. They haven't consummated their marriage with sexual relations, but they are betrothed or they're engaged. They're espoused. Back in Matthew, go back to Matthew 1. Matthew 1, verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away, privily divorce her. While he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him, in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. Now this is Joseph's perspective. We looked at Mary's perspective in Luke 1. That which is conceived of her is of the Holy Ghost, and she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Isaiah 7, 14, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. So Joseph and Mary did not have sexual relations until after Jesus was born. And yes, Mary had sex with Joseph. There's this idea in religion that Mary is a perpetual virgin, that even tonight, even today, Mary has never had sex with any man. That, that is religious tradition. That is a lie. Okay? I can't imagine a married woman 
not having sex with her husband. Eh? That's ridiculous. It's nonsense. Eh? It's not meant to make sense. Religion is not meant to make sense. It's for people who simply believe whatever they hear and they don't think about what they're hearing. They just, oh yes, I agree. Bobblehead church members. They don't think for themselves. They just listen to Mother Church or Father so-and-so, Reverend so-and-so, Professor so-and-so, Doctor so-and-so, whoever. Okay? Not listening to the Holy Spirit. In Luke chapter 2, Luke chapter 2, Mary, she's great with child, verse 5. Think about this. Oh, think. Joseph and Mary, Joseph and Mary, and Mary is, she's nine months pregnant. Joseph has to pack up Mary for a trip. And they will travel from Nazareth all the way through the mountains to Bethlehem of Judea. Bethlehem Ephratah. That's a trip that would take about three days. 70 miles, 113 kilometers. Mountainous terrain. Mary is in her final days of pregnancy. And she has to travel three days on a donkey, on a camel, in a wagon. Poor woman. She's a teenager. An arduous trip. But Joseph is with her. Faithful. The Lord Jesus Christ, he had a godly stepfather, Joseph. Verse 6, Luke 2, 6. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son. Just like in Matthew 1. She brought forth her firstborn son. It's her firstborn son. That firstborn there, that confirms to us, Mary had no children before Christ. She did have children after him, absolutely. You read about them. Matthew 12, Matthew 13, you read about them in Mark 3 and Mark 6. And when we were in those passages, I explained to you. Joseph and Mary had children after Jesus Christ was born. Joseph and Mary had at least six children. Four sons and two daughters at least. They were half-brothers of Christ. They all shared Mary as their mother, biological mother. While Joseph and Mary are in Bethlehem, Judah, Bethlehem, Judea, Bethlehem, Ephratah, Mary gives birth, just as the angel Gabriel had promised back in chapter 1. The virgin gave birth to a child, to the Son of God's humanity, human body here. Mary delivers her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Oh, that, there's a lot in that one verse. There's a lot in that one verse. Let's unpack it. While she's in Bethlehem, Judea, she brings forth her firstborn son. She delivers her firstborn son. In 
in the book of Micah, come back to Micah chapter 5. Micah chapter 5. Long ago, 700 years before Christ, the prophet Micah wrote this. Micah 5, 2. But thou, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, Though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting, from everlasting. Olam, Hebrew, Olam, from everlasting. Who is from everlasting? Only God. Messiah is from everlasting. The book of Psalms says, From everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Everlasting this way, everlasting that way. From everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Who is everlasting? God is everlasting. Who in Micah 5, 2 is everlasting? Messiah. See? Jesus Christ is... Jehovah God in human flesh. The modern English versions, by the way, their translators will render Olam everlasting when it refers to God. They won't, they won't translate it everlasting when it, fer, when it refers to Messiah. Micah 5, 2 in modern versions reads, from of old, from ancient times. Ooh! See? They hid the deity of Christ there. In the King James Bible, the, the Messiah is from everlasting. See? Who's from everlasting? Only one. It's God. God Almighty is from everlasting. Micah 5 2. Bethlehem Ephratah. There was a Bethlehem in the north. No, it's not Bethlehem in the north. It's Bethlehem Ephratah in the south. Though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, Judah, Judea, Judea, down south. See? Bethlehem Ephratah is down south. Judea, Judah. So, if we come over to Matthew 2 now, Matthew 2 verse 1. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, as Herod the Great, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and are come to worship him. Now, this is not when Christ is just born. The wise men come later. The wise men, according to verse 16, Christ could have been as much as two years old here when the wise men visited him. Okay? Let me keep reading. Matthew 2, 2. Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled in all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, and thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah. <laughs> uh, the Bible scholars there in Israel, they actually change the verse. Micah 5.2 says, you are least, Bethlehem. The scholars, though, they change it. Bethlehem, you're not the least <laughs> among the princes of Judah. For out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. The point is, they knew. Israel's religious leaders knew what their Hebrew Bible said. They knew Messiah would be born. Christ would be born in Bethlehem. Of Judea, Judah, Ephratah. Oh, he's about two years old here. As much as two years old. Christ is about two years old here. Why, did, why haven't they gone visit him yet? Uh, see, the Gentiles, the, 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 the wise men, they come to visit Israel's Messiah. 
Why hasn't Israel's religious leaders, who know where he was born, why haven't they gone visit him? See? They didn't visit him when he was born. And now that he's living in Nazareth as a little boy, they still don't visit him. The wise men go, the scribes don't follow. <laughs> the chief priests and scribes, yeah, they know the Bible. They just don't believe it in the heart. They know it in the head. They don't believe it in the heart. Mm -hmm. Plenty of people like that today. They are familiar with the Bible. They just don't believe it. Luke 2, 7. She brought forth her firstborn son. Mary gave birth to the Lord Jesus Christ in Bethlehem of Judea. Bethlehem Ephratah. Exactly as God foretold 700 years prior. Think about it. Caesar Augustus, he ordered everybody go back to your ancestors' hometown. Joseph and Mary went back to their ancestors' hometown, David's hometown, which was what? Bethlehem Ephratah. God used the decree of a pagan king to fulfill Bible prophecy. Augustus Caesar didn't know it. But by forcing Joseph and Mary to move from Nazareth to Bethlehem south, he had made them move so Messiah would be born precisely where God said he'd be born. Had Caesar Augustus not given that mandate, Christ would have been born in Nazareth where Joseph and Mary lived. The prophecy wouldn't have been fulfilled. See the wisdom of the God of the Bible Caesar Augustus, he wasn't acting to fulfill Bible prophecy. He inadvertently did fulfill Bible prophecy, though. Luke 2, verse 7. She brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger. Wrapped him in swaddling clothes. That is a good King James Bible word, swaddling, also omitted from modern English versions. Swaddling, what in the world are swaddling clothes? Swaddling clothes. Swaddling. It's a frequentative, it's a recurring or repeating form of a word. Swathe. The idea, swaddling clothes, binding the child with strips or layers of cloth or fabric. <laughs> if you want to imagine a mummy being wrapped, okay? those strips of cloth are wrapped around the limbs of the baby. This was a common Middle Eastern practice in those times. To make the bones grow straight, the parents of these Middle Eastern children, babies, they wrap the children with those bands or strips of cloth or linen. She wraps baby Jesus in swaddling clothes. Warmth. Warmth. She wrapped him in swaddling clothes. Can you imagine, my friend, the Creator God, the God who spoke 
creation into existence from nothing. Let there be. Let there be. Let there be. There he is in a frail bundle, a tiny newborn just out of Mary's womb, the God-man. Eh. He's God and he's man. We never want to ignore either side. His nature is God and man. Mary is the mother of his humanity. She is his mother in the human sense. But he existed prior to her. He existed prior to his conception in her womb. He was always God. He was not always man. Now... I should say this too. Mormon doctrine were equal opportunity offenders here. Okay. Talk about Mormonism for a minute. Mormonism teaches that before we are conceived in our mother's womb, that we were disembodied spirits in heaven. And that really the reason why Mormons practiced polygamy before the U.S. government outlawed it in the late 19th century. They still do it today though. Religion is hard to abandon. Religious tradition. That's why you see Mormons having a lot of children. Okay? They're reproducing to have physical bodies for those disembodied spirits to come down and dwell in those physical bodies. Really strange. Okay? Well, I'm here to tell you life begins at conception. It doesn't begin prior to conception. We didn't exist until we were conceived in our mother's womb, just like John the Baptist. But Jesus Christ, on the other hand, he did exist before his conception. Luke 2, listen. She wrapped him in swaddling clothes. He took on human flesh, didn't he? The God-man, God took on human flesh. So he's clothed in a body of flesh. Plus he's clothed with the swaddling clothes. He became a man so he would die that we might then take on his spiritual clothes, righteousness. Right standing before his heavenly Father. All right. Luke 2 7. She laid him in a manger. She laid him in a manger. There is no room for them in the inn. No room for them in the inn. A manger. What is a manger? A manger is simply a trough, it's a container out of which livestock eat. No room for Messiah. No room for Messiah in the inn. No room for Messiah in the inn. But we do have room for him in a trough. Okay. Remember Isaiah 7.14? I alluded to it. We didn't read it. Isaiah 7.14. Isaiah 7.14. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, God with us. Isaiah 9, verse 6. Flip over to chapter 9, verse 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, 
And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Those are his two comings. We looked at Micah 5, 2 already. She puts him in a manger. There's no room for them in the inn. Now the Bible never explicitly states that Christ was born in a barn <laughs> or a stable. That's the verse that causes people to assume he was born in a barn. That the nativity scene occurred in a barn. Some would go so far as to say Jesus was born in a cave. What I want you to see is, verse 7 again, there is no room for them in the inn. The inn, this is how, this is how I look at it. Okay. The inn was most likely the second story, second floor. Okay. It wasn't the ground level, it was the, the next level. That's where people stayed. The first floor, or the ground level, that was where their animals were kept. So if you want to call it a barn, call it a barn. But there was a trough nearby. Oh, there were animals somewhere around there being taken care of. They had no room for them in the inn. Messiah? Oh, we have no room for him. Here, put him in that trough, a lowly trough. For nearly seven centuries, over seven centuries, Isaiah was read in the synagogues. Micah was read in the synagogues. They heard about Messiah being born. They knew Messiah would be born one day. According to the schedule of Daniel chapter 9, They knew Bethlehem, Ephratah, Bethlehem, Judea would be the place. They knew the time of Daniel 9. There was the star that even the wise men saw. It was so obvious. Here's a, a virgin pregnant. This has to be Messiah. How did Israel receive her Messiah, her Christ? Oh, here, we have no room for you in the inn, but why not lie down there in that manger, that trough, where animals eat? The, the apathetic attitude Israel has toward her Messiah will continue all the way through to the end of his life. On Calvary's cross, they'll put him to death. At his trial, just before they crucify him, John 19, 15, they cry out to Pilate, we have no king but Caesar. We don't want Jesus. We're happy with the pagan Roman emperor reigning over us. We don't, want to, we don't want the son of David. Hmm. So that attitude, uh, look, at, look at Matthew 2. It says, Herod and Jerusalem, they were troubled when they heard, oh, Messiah's born. Oh. Hey. Jerusalem isn't ready. Jerusalem isn't ready for her Messiah. Bethlehem, Judea isn't either. Luke 2, verse 8. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, 
which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, good will toward men. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which is come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby, babe, lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen, as it was told unto them. Alright, so Luke 2, verse 8. At the time Mary delivers Jesus, in the same country there are shepherds staying out in the field watching their flocks guarding them against predatory animals and thieves. Now, remember, there are animal sacrifices being offered in the Jerusalem temple. Here in this region, five or so miles, ten kilometers or so, from Bethlehem, Judea is Jerusalem. They're watching those sacrificial sheep there in the suburbs of Jerusalem, if you want to call them that. They're out at night. It wasn't winter time, by the way. It's late September, early October. The shepherds, they're out in their fields. Would they be out in the, in the fields during winter time? It's snowy. It's the rainy season in Israel. This isn't Christmas time. The wise men, by the way, they're not showing up for several more months, if not another year or two. The, the nativity scenes we see at Christmas time, they're wrong. Okay? They're wrong. The wise men and the shepherds never came to visit Jesus simultaneously. They weren't there at the same time. The shepherds came first. A year or two later, then the wise men came. Okay? See how religious tradition causes confusion? See how assuming the Bible to teach something when it doesn't teach that misleads us? Okay? Always be sure you know what the Bible says. Don't just presume it to teach something. Oh, I, I think it says that. How do you know? Because I've heard it taught like that. No, 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 no. You have to read, my friend. Okay? If you're illiterate, you have no excuse. You can read, but you don't read. You let the priest, the preacher, the theologian, the professor, they read it for you and they interpret it. No, that's dangerous. That's dangerous. Because if that person is wrong, oh, and you hope the person is right, but what if they're wrong? Ooh, see? God will not give you room to have the excuse there. But my preacher told me it's my preacher's fault. I was just listening to my preacher. Yeah, but see, you were a free moral agent. God will not look at the preacher when it's time for you to stand before him. He will look at you. What have you done with my word? What have you done with my son? Have you trusted him? Have you studied my word? Have you believed my word in your heart? Oh, you haven't. You were following the denomination, the church, the tradition, the seminary, whatever. 
Okay? They will contribute to your spiritual destruction. That's serious. I wouldn't want to be in any of those leader shoes. And there are millions leading, misleading, should I say. Christ was conceived, remember, I told you this already. Christ was conceived at Christmas time. I showed you how to date that back in Luke chapter 1. Luke 1, verse 5. Christ is six months younger than John the Baptist. John the Baptist was conceived in the summer. Christ was conceived in the winter. Nine months after late December is late September, huh? Simple math. You don't have to be a mathematical genius to figure that out. Okay? Christ was born in late September, coinciding with the Feast of Tabernacles. The Feast of Tabernacles. I might as well show you. Leviticus. Leviticus. Come to Leviticus 23. Leviticus 23, Leviticus chapter 23, the Feast of Jehovah, the Feast of the Lord. Listen to this one. Leviticus 23, Leviticus 23:33, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, The fifteenth day of this seventh month, shall be the Feast of Tabernacles for seven days unto the Lord. On the first day, Leviticus 23, 35, On the first day shall be in holy convocation, ye shall do no servile work therein. Seven days ye shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. On the eighth day shall be in holy convocation unto you, and ye shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. It is a solemn assembly, and ye shall do no servile work therein. These are the feasts of the Lord, which ye shall proclaim to be holy convocations, to offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord, a burnt offering and a meat offering, a sacrifice and drink offerings, everything upon his day, beside the Sabbaths of the Lord, and beside your gifts, and beside all your vows, and beside all your free will offerings, which ye give to the Lord. Also the fifteenth day of the seventh month, when ye have gathered in the fruit of the land, ye shall keep a feast unto the Lord seven days. On the first day shall be a Sabbath. See, tabernacles, okay, watch. We'll read more about tabernacles. The first day shall be a Sabbath. That's a special Sabbath. And on the eighth day shall be a Sabbath. That's another special Sabbath. That's not the regular Saturday Sabbath. Those are special days wherein no work is done. And ye shall take you on the first day the boughs of goodly trees, Leviticus 23.40, branches of palm trees and the boughs of thick trees and willows of the brook, and ye shall rejoice before the Lord your God seven days, and ye shall keep it a feast unto the Lord seven days in the year. It shall be a statute forever. In your generations ye shall celebrate it in the seventh month, ye shall dwell in booths seven days. All that are Israelites born shall dwell in booths, that your generations may know that I made, I made the children of Israel to dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. And Moses declared unto the children of Israel the feast of the Lord. Huh. Okay. Come over to John 1 now. John 1. John chapter 1. John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Verse 14. And the Word... See, the Word was with God, the Father, and the Word was God. The Word was made flesh, verse 14, and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. 
The Word was made flesh, the incarnation, and dwelt among us. Dwelt among us? Tabernacle. The human body, the human body, is called a tabernacle in Scripture. That is 2 Corinthians 5 and 2 Peter 1. The soul lives in the physical body, temporarily, of course, because the physical body dies and they separate. Christ took on a human body, didn't he? Yes. He tabernacled. He tabernacled with Israel. God with us. Emmanuel, God with us. Now listen. Think. It's so simple. When do you think Christ would have been born? I just explained to you Tabernacles is the time of year in September, late September, early October. Tabernacles is the time of year when Israel dwells in tabernacles, booths, temporary dwelling places. When do you think Christ would have been born? During that time. He was tabernacling with them His birth there was at the same time they were celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles. Coinciding with the Feast of Tabernacles. He wasn't born at Christmas time, but he was conceived at Christmas time. Of course, Satan and the pagans counterfeits. There's a, there's a, there's a, a counterfeit religious belief that the sun god is reborn during the winter solstice Christmas time that's nothing but a mockery of the miracle of Christmas which is not the virgin birth of Christ It was the virgin conception of Christ at Christmas time. His birth was normal. It was the conception that was unique. No human father involved. But the birth of Jesus was normal. The conception was unusual. It was miraculous. No human father contributed. Certainly not Joseph. Or any other man. It was the Holy Spirit empowering Mary's womb to conceive. Just like it was the Holy Spirit empowering Elizabeth's womb to conceive. Now in that case though, Elizabeth, she was old. She wasn't a virgin. Elizabeth was old. She was beyond childbearing. But that was miraculous too. She conceived. So there are some shepherds. They're watching their flocks by night. Listen. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them. So it, it, it's pitch black, it's dark. And suddenly there's a light. <gasps> the angel of the Lord came upon them, the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. Oh, yes, should be afraid. Remember, angels are frightening beings. When they would appear, people would get, get scared in the scripture. Remember, over a year earlier, Zacharias, verse 12 of chapter 1, Zacharias was afraid when Gabriel, the angel Gabriel, appeared. Scared. Mary. She was afraid too, back in chapter 1, verse 29. Judgment. 
angels were sent a lot of times to judge. Don't have to be afraid. No, this is a time of divine blessing. Luke 1, Luke 2, Luke 2, verse 10. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, don't be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings. You and Galilean, gospel, good news. Glad tidings, good tidings of great joy. That's a common theme in Luke. Great joy, 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 joy. Rejoicing what God's doing. Rejoicing because of what God is doing. Which shall be to all people. Which shall be to all people. See that, that, that Gentile perspective there, that world perspective that Luke has? All people. Remember, remember, Gentile salvation is not a secret. In prophecy... Is it? No. Remember our last study. I've been hiding the Bible timeline here so it won't, won't distract you. Gentile salvation is not a secret in prophecy. God would bless all the world, all the Gentiles, through Israel in that kingdom, the Abrahamic covenant. So it shouldn't surprise us that this good news, this good, good news, these good tidings, glad tidings, gospel, this gospel, is to all people. We'll read later in Luke chapter 2. Messiah is a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of his people Israel. Lighten the Gentiles, all people. All people. Messiah showing up is for all the world to be blessed through Israel. Genesis 12, Genesis 22, Isaiah 60, Zechariah 8, Acts 3, Romans 15. Now, the secret, the mystery of which we're a part today is through Israel's fall, salvation has come to the Gentiles. That's Romans 11, verse 11, 12, 13, 14. Gentiles are saved today through the fall of Israel, through Paul's gospel. In prophecy, Israel rises to kingdom glory. She's not fallen. She rises to kingdom glory. And all the world is blessed and saved through her. Her instrumentality. God uses her. Kingdom of priests. Hey. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord in the city of David. What's the city of David? The city of David is not Jerusalem. Not Jerusalem. The city of David, verse 4, Bethlehem, Judah. I have here the Book of Mormon. Let me read this to you. This is why... No, I, I, I'll read it to you. Pay attention. The Book of Mormon, Alma, chapter 7, verse 10. And behold, he shall be born of Mary at Jerusalem, which is the land of our forefathers, she being a virgin, a precious and chosen vessel, who shall be overshadowed and conceived by the power of the Holy Ghost and bring forth a son, yea, even the Son of God. Oh, did you catch it? According to the Book of Mormon, Jesus was born at Jerusalem. Oops. Joseph Smith told a fib there. See, he read Luke 2, Jesus is born in the city of David, Jerusalem. And he wrote it down in the Book of Mormon. <laughs> no, the Bible didn't say Jesus was born in Jerusalem. As I've told you already, there are many verses in the Bible to indicate Jesus was born in Bethlehem, Judah, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, Bethlehem, Judea. The city of David, the city of David, that terminology doesn't refer from where David reigned, but rather where he was born. 
David was born in Bethlehem, Judah. Yeah. Not in Jerusalem. Christ, he wasn't born in Jerusalem. He was born in Bethlehem, Judah too. Yeah. So the Book of Mormon is a lie. Yeah. That's, that is not another testament of Jesus Christ. The Book, book of Mormon is a lie. Yeah. Either, listen, I tell you this all the time about We can't have two authorities. Listen, it's assumed that the Book of Mormon is, quote, another testament of Jesus Christ. Here we have the Bible, and here we have the sequel, the Book of Mormon. Okay. Now, think about it. Okay. The Bible says Christ was born in Bethlehem. Book of Mormon claims he was born in Jerusalem. We will have to decide which is our authority. Bible, Bethlehem, Mormon, Jerusalem. Hmm. We'll have to set one aside. Either the Bible goes, we throw it away, or we throw away the Book of Mormon. You can't have two authorities. Yeah. Well, I can... I'm not a betting man, but if, if I did bet, I'd put all my money on people retaining the Book of Mormon as opposed to retaining the Bible. If they had to choose, they'll throw the Bible away and keep everything else. That's just human nature. Hey, let me move on. I'm running out of time. Israel... Israel's Messiah is born. For unto you is born this day, Luke 2.11, in the city of David, a Savior, Jesus. His name is Jesus. He shall save his people from their sins. Jehovah Savior, Matthew 1.21, Luke 1.31. Jesus, name him Jesus. Savior, Joshua, Jehoshua, which is Christ, Messiah, anointed, Psalm 2.2, John 1.41, Acts 4.26. He's also the Lord, Jehovah. See his three names? Savior, Jesus, Christ, Messiah, anointed, Lord, Jehovah. Savior, Christ, Lord. This shall be a sign unto you. The virgin giving birth to a baby will be a sign. Isaiah 7.14. Here's the sign. The Jews require a sign. You shall find the babe, verse 12, wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God. Praising God. That's common in Luke 2. That's another theme in Luke. Luke 1, 64. Luke 2, 13. Luke 2, 20. Luke 8, 40, 18, 43. Luke 19, 37. Luke 24, 53. God is being praised. There's a multitude of the heavenly host. Multitude of the heavenly host. Heavenly host? There, there's an army of angels there. They're not fighting, though. They're singing. There's a choir. A choir. A choir. We'll see that next time. We'll stop right there at verse 12. Go and see the babe, wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And there's an angel with a number of other angels appearing, and they're all praising God, the heavenly host. We'll see that next time, and what that's all about. And we'll say more about it next time. All right, so that's good enough. We'll pick up at verse 13 next time. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time of study. Thank you for your word. The King James Bible, preserved in English. Thank you for sending your son to become a man. That he would die for our sin, shed his sinless blood to pay for our sins. To be buried, to put away those sins, and to be raised again to give us new life, newness of life. Thank you. As we continue in 
Luke chapter 2, edifying courage and enlightenment in Christ's name, amen.